This series of films will be a record of what the interior spaces of the ship was, how we believe it was used, uh, what parts of it are original, and what interesting features uh, might survive. So let's go on board. Now we're on the lower gun deck, or what would have been called the lower deck, uh, which is very similar to the upper gun deck just above. Uh, it's an accommodation space for about half the crew, uh, as well as the working space for a little bit more than half of the main armament. There were originally 30 24-pounder cannon on this deck, uh, including two very large old-style 24s mounted all the way at the forward end. In addition to those two main functions, there are two other things that happen on this deck that are important for the operation of the ship. Uh, one is uh, for hauling up and handling the anchors. Uh, the anchor cables come into the ship on this deck and are tied to the ship here, as well as the machinery for lifting the anchors is located here. The other main function that occurs here is all the way at the stern, uh, where the steering gear comes into the ship from the rudder that connects it to the whip staff that we saw on the deck above. So let's take a start by looking at at the uh, riding bits where you would have tied the anchor to the ship. This massive construction uh, is the riding bits. This is how you tied the anchor to the ship. Uh, and so this construction is anchored into as much of the ship structure as possible in order to distribute the pull of the anchor or the pull of the ship on the anchor. Uh, the anchor cable itself came in through the hawse hole, a uh, round hole about 40 centimeters in diameter in the bow next to the stem, would have led down along the deck and then to tie it in place, it would have come up under the crossbar and then around in front of the vertical bit and then leads back over this, over the deck, uh, and then down through this hatch uh, in the deck and through another hatch in the deck below where there's a compartment dedicated to coiling the anchor cables up. This whole structure is mounted in a massive deck plate uh, that's made out of oak timbers about 25 centimeters thick that are then bolted and nailed down to five successive deck beams uh, so that the, this whole structure can't really go anywhere. Today, this has the slight disadvantage in that because the bits don't get any shorter, the timber doesn't shrink over its length, this is holding up the deck in this area and the rest of the ship is settling around it so that we have a hump in the deck uh, right here that's caused by the riding bits. This is where the anchor cable comes into the ship, through the hawse hole, uh, a massive timber uh, next to the stem uh, with other timbers on the outside to protect the side of the ship from the friction of the cable running out and in. To raise the anchor, one has to draw it in through this hole, uh, but because the cable is so large and so stiff, is very difficult to handle on it directly. You can't grab it and pull it with a large number of men like you can a rope in the rigging. Uh, and you can't even wrap it around any of the ship's capstans, the machines or the winches for hauling in on cables. Instead, you had to tie it to an intermediate rope that was much smaller and much more manageable. That intermediate uh, piece of rope is called the messenger. It was essentially an endless loop of rope that ran along the deck all the way to the capstan behind the mainmast, where it could be wrapped around the capstan, and the capstan could then be used to draw in the cable. The messenger itself is only about six centimeters in diameter. Some fragments of it survive and were found on this deck, along with two anchor cables that were laid out on this deck uh, as the ship was prepared to anchor that evening. And so there were long lengths of the cable lying on the deck when the ship was excavated, as well as some fragments of that messenger. It runs all the way aft to the capstan.
Valsa has three capstans, each with slightly different functions. The largest of the three, the main capstan stood here on the lower gun deck, uh, was mounted in this hole. Uh, it had two main functions. Uh, the first and most probably most commonly used uh, was for the anchor. The anchor cable was tied to the messenger, which led from all the way up at the bow back here, and then men walking around the capstan would be able to draw in the anchor. This is also placed here so that you can use it for the heavy lines uh, of the main mast. So the top rope that you would use for raising or lowering the top mast could be led to the capstan here, uh, as could that main halyard if you had to raise or lower the main yard and its sail, which weighed a couple of tons. You could take that load to the capstan and then use the strength of up to 24 men at one time pushing on the bars around and walking around the capstan. The bars for the capstan uh, spanned a distance of about five meters uh, so that they would uh, provide plenty of space, but it would use all of the available space here. And it might even have been necessary to move the guns at the gun ports either side in order to make it possible to use this capstan. Valsa has four pumps for removing water from the ship. The main pump is a single uh, alder tree trunk bored out over its length. The others are all made out of soldered lead pipe. Uh, the other main pump on the center line of the ship came up from the bottom of the ship in this wooden trunk. Uh, and then there was a, a lead sheet basin uh, just inside this box. And as that filled with water from the pumps, it drained into a pair of lead pipes that ran out to either side. And those pipes ran inside this box or trunk or dale that was built against the backside of this beam. Uh, and it's quite a nice little construction uh, that provides a lot of space for a pipe that's really only about six centimeters in diameter, maybe seven. Um, the ends of the boards are notched uh, in a form of decoration and then that follows all the way into a hole through the side of the ship uh, that the pipe runs through, and then there's a little block on the outside that the end of the pipe is tacked to so that you could uh, drain water over the side. The other two pumps also are, are on this deck, and they come up at the sides of the ship, uh, and there for picking up water when the ship leans to one side, they drain the bilges. They're the only ones that are properly called bilge pumps. Uh, this is just a pump. This part of the ship is also a workshop because we've established the workshop for maintenance of the ship in this location uh, where we can keep tools and materials needed for uh, all sorts of different conservation activities that uh, happen on board the ship. Uh, we've been on, had a major project to replace all of the old iron bolts or steel bolts from the 1960s with modern stainless steel. Uh, and then we're also preparing to build a new support structure under and inside the ship. Uh, and so this is uh, the, I guess you'd say, the, the industrial background to that side of the museum's activities and what it takes to maintain something like Vasa uh, for centuries into the future. Most of the lower gun deck is a single open space to make it as easy as possible to handle the cannon that were mounted here. But there's a smaller room all the way at the stern, the gun room, uh, which traditionally was where uh, the non-commissioned officers might live, although we have very little evidence of that on this ship, uh, and also where the master gunner kept his stores, uh, spares for the guns, loading equipment, things like that. This is uh, walled off by this bulkhead, which originally had a sliding door uh, to close it. The deck in the gun room is raised above the deck in the lower gun deck, uh, and this appears to be an alteration in the structure while the ship was being built, probably to provide a little bit more working headroom in the compartment directly beneath. There were two very large cannon mounted there that fired through the transom, uh, and they may have wanted more working headroom for those guns. Uh, and so made this slight alteration while the ship was being built. One of the dominant features of the gun room uh, is the steering system for the ship. 
this is a, what would you call a tiller flat in a modern vessel, that the tiller or helm, this big horizontal beam, which is about nine meters long and weighs close to half a ton, connects the whipstaff in the steerage to the rudder all the way at the stern, and it comes in through a rectangular port, uh, runs over the sweep, uh, a big beam that carries some of its weight on a roller bearing, uh, and then is joined to the whipstaff by this banjo fitting. Uh, which has a hole in it that slides over the end of the helm. And then in the end of the helm, there's a vertical hole for an iron linchpin that would keep the whipstaff from sliding off of the, t of the helm. The maximum travel of this is defined partly by the deck structure, and the underside of the deck is cut away to let the whipstaff ride as high up as possible. And so the, uh, the actual limit is when the helm encounters the side of the ship which is at about 23 degrees of rudder angle. The gun room housed four of the ship's uh, planned 72 cannon. Uh, there were the last broadside port on each side that held one of the lightweight 24 pounders. And in fact, those two guns are two of the three that we still have. It was not possible for the salvers in the 1660s to remove them. Uh, and so they were found here uh, in the gun room. There are also a pair of round ports in the transom for two more 24-pounders that could have fired out through the transom. The carriages for those two guns were found here, but we can see from the carriages that there were never any guns mounted in them. There are two of the eight empty gun ports uh, when the ship sailed. There's two more guns uh, on the ship. The two of the largest that would have been mounted on the ship are in this space, but on the deck below uh, on the orlop.